to move on now with uh, Dr. David Fletcher, who can uh, provide us with uh, extensive insight into the climate of the times when uh, baseball in general and uh, the Black Sox in particular, what the game is like, was like, what the principles were like, and uh, how they came to arrive at uh, the situation they did. David? Thank you. Uh, All right. Uh, once again, I want to thank the Chicago Historical Society and my fellow panelists for being here. I do want to uh, quickly recognize one honored guest here. We've got Johnny Washington, famous baseball player, Negro League, also Red Sox. So it's really delighted that uh, we could put this uh, panel together. I know we've got a lot of competing events tonight, uh, but as I like to try to tell people, this is the only postseason Chicago baseball event this year. Uh, uh, so anyway, uh, it's it's really a, a great honor for me to be part of this as uh, someone who's very interested in baseball and, and being uh, a fan and, and have an academic interest in this very key aspect and history of the sport of baseball, in particular Chicago, and it's really, for me, a real honor to be up here with these people, sort of a Black Sox family reunion, uh, is the best way I can describe it. But it's, uh, you know, we kind of got an overview, and I'm sort of the, a little bit more of a narrator, it's a very, very complex story, uh, which, uh, you know, it's 85 years ago, uh, and in fact, the World Series, actually October 5th, it was an off day. Today it rained. There was an off day. It was after, it was after um, game three of a, of a game, excuse me, game four of the World Series, and uh, game five was delayed a day uh, because of rain in Chicago. Um, the 1919 season was, was not the first time, as Dan had talked about, as far as the influences of gambling reaching baseball. Uh, in fact, there's probably some pretty good evidence that the 1918 World Series, which featured the Chicago Cubs, and they actually played at Comiskey Park, if people don't know that, against the Boston Red Sox, was probably fixed. Uh, also, some suggestion the 1914 World Series was also fixed. Uh, Dan talked about the influence of Hal Chase. Uh, in fact, if some of you are interested in that, there's a great new biography about Hal Chase. Uh, that just got published this summer, and it's which is a great read, which gives a lot of background, and, and also has a little bit of the story of the Black Sox in, 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 in part in that. Hal Chase, uh, they tried to kick him out of baseball, and he got, he got it was a whitewash, and the fact that he got away with uh, all the fixing he did in 1918 and early 1919 when he did the investigation, certainly had some aspect in development of the uh, scandal that happened in 1919 with the World Series. Um, I think one of the things to set the history behind, it's nice we had that little trailer before, but this is a, a real different different era in our history. And it's the whole theme of the historical societies done tonight, the loss of innocence, I think really focuses on this. 1919, the world really changed. America was a changing country. And Charles Comiskey really represented, I think, the last of the 19th century uh, men of ethics and real uh, basically self-starter, self-made man. And you know, he had a different value set. He had an emerged this new thing. And he certainly is, should be commended for his creation of baseball as an entertainment industry. And one of the things I think all of us as people from Chicago don't recognize how much Chicago is the modern capital of baseball, the growth of baseball. American League was started by Charles Comiskey down at the Fisher Building with Van Johnson. Uh, Judge Landis had his office here to 1944. So we don't, we don't have credit for how much baseball has, has really grown in the city of Chicago. But the era was different. It was after World War I had ended. Uh, the White Sox had won the World Series in 1917. In 1918, after being the world champs, their team sank to think sixth place. A lot of that was because of the war. Uh, Joe Jackson, he ended, he ended up going out to uh, the shipyards in New Jersey. Uh, several other players enlisted. Uh, Buck Weaver ended up later that year, uh, 1918, working up in, a, uh, in Beloit, Wisconsin. Uh, it was a different, different era. And the, the, the season was shortened in 1918. The receipts had gone down. The owners were afraid they weren't going to make any money. 
1919, they didn't know what was going to happen with, with baseball after the end of the war. Were, were the fans going to come back? And the season was short, 140 games. And it was a different, different era as far as uh, we had just gone through a very uh, significant epidemic of influenza. That's kind of my middle medical talk here this, tonight as a doctor. But the influenza impact you know, killed hundreds of thousands of people in the United States. And in fact, actually has a very important asterisk in the 1919 World Series and the fact that the pitcher Red Faber, who was a, he made the Hall of Fame, uh, he was a Black Sox pitcher and in fact is one of the primary sources for Elliot Eisenhoff's book, Eight Men Out, actually contracted influenza and because of the effects of influenza could not pitch in the 1919 World Series. And perhaps if he did pitch, the, the outcome of that World Series would be different. But we had the flu, in, flu in, in epidemic, we had the after effects of the war, we had the steel strike near Comiskey Park at, at 35th and Shields for the race riots. It was a different era. It's just a lot of things going on over. At the same time, prohibition was coming down. And so, uh, baseball, they didn't know what was going to go down. And in the summer of 1919, the Black Sox players, uh, uh, White Sox players, uh, nearly went on strike because they thought that they had not gotten sufficient races. And so the seeds of the, of the fix really started in the summer of 1919 uh, due to the salary fix. And then the actual fix did develop actually in August of 1919. And one of the primary characters here is the, the arch villain, the, the real fixer is Arnold Rothstein. And a lot of people don't realize that he actually was involved in a lot of betting in the 1917 World Series and bet against the White Sox in 1917 when they beat the New York Giants. The series fix got basically hatched in August of 1919 and uh, out of the racetrack in Saratoga, New York. This little slide up here is a, a slide of the contracts. This is actually Harry Grabner's writing, and it outlines the salaries paid to the, to the various ballplayers. Shoeless Joe made 6000 Buck Weaver 6000 uh, He ended up, Buck Weaver, as Dan talked about, was one of the first to actually get the 10-day out clause removed from his contract and ended up getting a, a multi-year contract, one of the first baseball players ever. Well, anyway, the, the seed to the fix began in August 1919, uh, and it basically was uh, hatched out of some attempts, as I said before, the 1918 World Series. It wasn't certain the White Sox were going to make the World, World Series. They were ahead. And that was, can you give the slide with the diagram on the fix there? This is a very complex slide, which I'd be glad to email anybody that's interested. It's a three-page slide. It kind of gives the complexity of the fix. Basically, as you see, it, Chick Gandel, who is one of the uh, eight players banned for life, and he was the only of the eight players not to play for the White Sox in 1920. He was the first baseman. If you see pictures of Chick Gandel in some of these great Chicago Historical Society pictures, he has the worst scowl on his face. And of all the players in the, in the scandal, he made out the best. He got 35000 bucks, and that's why he didn't come back in the 1920 season. He didn't need to. He created a great lifestyle on the West Coast uh, because of the money he made to fix. Well, him and Ed Scott, the, the Scotty, the pitcher, uh, they hatched this idea and really started going in Boston when they first started doing this. They approached the Sports Sullivan, who uh, was depicted in the movie Eight Men Out, and they basically then went to New York in, in the middle of September of 1919, and this is when they tried to hatch this idea. And uh, they get a couple different versions of what happened. A couple different sets of gamblers got involved. Uh, Bill Burns, Billy Merrick uh, were kind of small time gamblers. They got no success getting money out of Arnold Rothstein. Uh, they hatched the idea to Ava Tell, who was known as a little champ. He was a boxer who was a cocky little guy who ended up telling a fib and that he'd gotten backing from Rothstein. Meanwhile, the Sports Sullivan guy, he got the money from Rothstein and finally, uh, they were trying to hatch this, this fix out with the players. Finally, before the World Series, some money arrived. A lot of back and forth bickering, and there was never any concrete plan on what to do, who was in the fix, who was not. But meanwhile, Major League Baseball already knew this was happening. About two weeks before the World Series, the National Commission that um, Dan talked about had gotten wind of it. They had a meeting in Chicago to discuss the fact the World Series was going to be fixed. They did not think it was possible. They thought it was impossible for a baseball team to 
fix a outcome of a game. Um, so anyway, the fix is set up. It's very complex, as, as described here. But as you, uh, most of you have seen the movie or know the story, basically the pitcher Eddie Scotty he got Seacott got ten thousand bucks put under his pillow by Gandalf the night before the game, and that starts the series of double crosses back and forth. It'll, it'll be historically debated for, for almost forever which games were fixed, which games were not. Uh, we're very fortunate uh, to have uh, some historical analysis of that, but the fact is we're not certain. I believe that games one, two, three, four, and game eight were had some element of fixing. Um, and there's some people that you know, debate that, there, that that's not. One of the nice aspects about the scheme though, is that not only it's about the ball players, and about the owners, and, and about the gamblers, but it's also about the sports writers. And I'm very sad we could not have as part of our panel Studs Turkle, who is the resident scholar here at the Chicago Historical Society. Studs played the Herald Examiner and former Chicago Tribune writer, Hugh Fullerton. And he was a very key person in the fix and watching this. He knew before the World Series happened in Cincinnati and rumors were swirling. He told Comiskey, he told Van Johns and the others that the games were fixed. And this is when we saw the, the gambling odds change, that the White Sox were heavily favored and suddenly the odds changed because the betting came on. So anyway, it was quite, a, quite an interesting situation. Uh, the Sox ended up losing game eight. It was a ninth game series that year because once again, baseball owners are trying to, to uh, rebound their losses from 1918. Uh, and so finally the Sox lost October 9th, 1919. Uh, some of you may give you a little bit of an inside story. If you've read the book or seen the movie, Eight Men Out, there's a description that pitcher Lefty Williams was approached by a, a man named Harry F., uh, who said that he didn't have to give up the biggest first inning to the Reds, that he would, him and his wife would uh, uh, be shot. Uh, actually, that's historically inaccurate. Um, I was told that uh, Elliot Asnoff, when he wrote the book in 1963, made up the character Harry F. His advice was literary agent to protect against any plagiarism for historical story. Since then, Elliot has been amused by a number of people historically who continue to cite this character who really does not exist. So the World Series got, was over October 9, 1919. Immediately, rumors had swirled. Hugh Fullerton, the next day, um, after the World Series had ended, suggested that seven players would not return to the 1920 White Sox. He did not name the seven players. And I'll let um, Mr. Canning can talk about uh, Mr. Fullerton's role a little bit more, perhaps, because he testified in the 1924 trial when Joe Jackson sued Charles Comiskey. This is a picture from game two of the World Series. It's a picture of uh, Buck Weaver out at the plate of game two at uh, the Red Lake Stadium, later known as Crosley Field. After the World Series, as I said before, Hugh Fullerton, because of uh, libel concerns, did not print names, name names at the time, but a series of articles came to come out because rumors were swirling. Right after the World Series, Charles Comiskey did know for sure the series had been fixed. Chuck, Chick Gandel and Harry and uh, um, uh, Happy Felsch went to his office after the game eight and uh, talked to him about this. Joe Jackson tried to return the $5,000 he got for the fix. Uh, but rumors swirled. The Herald Examiner Review, I told you about the uh, October 10th story. LA Times had a story. And then New York Evening. News had a story December 15, 1919, where Hugh Fullerton could not publish it in Chicago to basically outline exactly what happened, who, who Major League Baseball should go after and talk to. As I think for somebody to, some new information about the story, this is an aspect of the story I was able to uncover my research in the last, last 18 months. This is the un, probably the unsung hero of the Black Sox, Burt Collier. He ran, if anybody's familiar with that, Burt had a publication here in Chicago that was in, it gave tips on uh, gambling, uh, stocks, sports, and he actually was the person who really did the major work on covering the scandal. This is actually a, a compendium of headlines from the 1919 uh, headlines he had done. The bottom part of this slide, the top part, is basically he was vindicated 
that he did all this reporting about the Black Sox scandal. Next slide. This was, this was right after the World Series, and, and this is something that's not known in any other historical uh, books, or, and he's really never gotten any credit. Um, Patty's great-grandfather had offered a reward for $10,000 for uncovering uh, information about the World Series. This is a series of headlines. But for uh, my immediate right for, for Pat Anderson is the fact that her Uncle Buck was not named as one of the, the fixers. There's only seven people named, and this is some pretty, I think, prima facie evidence about his lack of involvement. But basically, uh, this is a series of headlines about the expose about the fix. Um, despite the fact that this, this came out, was, in, was known publicly, there was no attempt by Major League Baseball to investigate the World Series. And in fact, the 1920 World season was played. And it was finally a game between the Cubs and the Philadelphia Phillies in the end of August of 1920 that Bill Beck Sr., Bill's dad, who was the president of the Cubs, had found out a game was going to be fixed. And this led to the start of the grand jury that was investigating this game and started investigating the White Sox. And the reason why this happened was because a person that really is the hidden villain behind the Black Sox scandal as far as coming to light is the uh, former president of the American League, Van Johnson. Him and uh, Patty's great-grandfather started the American League. I sat down in the, uh, the JBR ballroom, the bar room down in the Fisher Building downtown. They ended up, uh, because of uh, some things that happened up in their Eagle River uh, hunting lodge, ended up hating each other. And Van Johnson is the one who decided to bring Charles Comiskey's head and ruin his team because he wanted to, to become the new commissioner of baseball, wanted to ruin Charles Comiskey. And he's the one who brought back the sleepy Bill Burns, one of the gamblers, to be the state's chief witnesses. So this started, so almost a whole year had passed. And this is actually the very sad event. This is the final box score for Joe Jackson and Buck Weaver, the day before uh, the confessions of Eddie Cicada and uh, Joe Jackson. And this was the day that shook baseball, September 28, 1920. Uh, Cicada and Jackson testified before the grand jury. The next day, Lefty Williams uh, released a statement, and also the Happy Felsch. Uh, spilled the beans to a uh, Chicago American reporter. And this is a famous scene with the uh, mythological Say It Ain't So event with Joe Jackson at the Criminal Courts building at, at Hubbard. One of the sad tales is later on, Buck's, Buck, when he had no income because he was banished from baseball, ended up having to paint that building as a day painter for the city of Chicago. Kind of ironic that he sat trial there. The grand jury ended up putting indictments out and it ended up having suspensions for the players. The trial happened. This was a suspension letter that the eight players received from Charles Kaminsky, kicking them out of, off the team. Next slide. And this is actually a famous Chicago Historical Society slide of the players. There is one player not was not at trial, Fred McMullen, the guy who only batted twice, batted 500 in the series even though he ended up getting uh, $10,000 in the fix, he did not stand trial. Um, this is the judge, Judge Hugo Friend, who was, uh, again, one of the primary sources for the 1963 book, Eight Men Out, by Elliot Asimov. Uh, I was very fortunate. I gave a talk about the uh, legal aspects of court reporters in the summer, the summer, and was really surprised that the granddaughter of this judge uh, was in attendance and she notified me she was going to be there. And so I got an opportunity to talk to her father, who was 87 years old, who was just delighted to be telling me stories about how much that uh, a Judge Friend had with his trial, and he's got a scrapbook I'm going to see, and so forth. Um, but as I said before, Judge Friend was one of the few uh, sources, that, the primary source that Elliot had for his 1963 book. Sadly, none of the transcripts from the 1921 trial exist. They vanished from the sands of time. This is George Gorman, who was the state's attorney prosecuting the players, and he also was a few gamblers that were part of the trial. Uh, this is defense attorneys for the players. Uh, this is Sleepy Bill Burns, who used to be a White Sox pitcher, uh, who was the state's uh, primary witness on the stand. Uh, and that's finally Judge Landis, who, he's the biggest winner in this, 
the reason, one of the reasons why he got to be part of the, uh, the commissioner of baseball is he endeared himself to the baseball moguls because he was the sitting judge here in Chicago in the Federal League, which was an insurgent league, started in 1914. Uh, he ended up basically sitting on their antitrust trial. So uh, he's the person who the baseball turned to to clean up the game. And as all of you know, after the, the jury had cleared the uh, players, the next day, Judge Landis banned him uh, from baseball. And here, 85 years later, they're still banned from the game of baseball. And as I said before, this was the epicenter of, of baseball and in the world was uh, People's Gas Building downtown. That's where Judge Landis ruled until his death on Thanksgiving Day in 1944. Uh, and all the major decisions of baseball from 1921 on to 1944 occurred in this building. That's sort of my brief, very brief comments about the very complex story uh, of the Black Sox fix and turning it back over to moderator. Thanks very much, Dave. Does anybody have any questions? In the, in the book and in the movie, they portray Kaminsky as like being duplicitous during the trial. Like he would win either way, if they were convicted or if they weren't. Is that true? How did Asimov get into his mind or his character to make that kind of a portrayal? Well, I think, I think, uh, I have, we actually, we're tr trying to get Elliot to actually be part of this panel. Elliot is actually, 85 years old in July. I've been to his home. I've spent some time with him. He really did not have any um, primary sources with the Comiskey. It was based on what was told by the players. He had only one player of the Black Sox talk to him. Only four were living when he did his research in the late 50s or early 60s. It was Happy Felch that gave him it was the Black Sox perspective. He got his in, insight from um, Red Favor and Ray Schlock, the catcher and Hugo Friend and a couple Reds. That's the only primary sources he had to give him information. And I think in defense of Patty, there is some misinformation about Charles Comiskey in the fact that the depiction as far as the $10,000 bonus for the pitcher is completely inaccurate as a, as a myth. In fact, he had a chance when his 30th game when they played the St. Louis Browns when he clinched the American League pennant that day. He ended up um, having no decision, the Sox went in, in uh, uh, late in the game. Uh, he basically, that was sort of the spin that he wanted to, I think, he, he wanted to, to give that marginally a, a view of, of Charles Comiskey as why the players did it. It's much more complex. Uh, one of the big aspects that's not really uncovered much in history is the fact of the cover-up after the scandal emerged and what Charles Comiskey did to protect his investment. And I think I'll, some of that I'll let, to, let to, uh, to Tom Cannon talk about because you know, his grandfather's one suit, uh, Mr. Kaminsky. Um, really, I think the thing is, I think history needs to be a sort of revisionist look at, at Charles Kaminsky's role uh, in the whole scandal. Obviously, uh, you know, he's a major character, uh, but there's, as I said before, the, the, the Van Johnson character had a lot darker forces, had a much darker agenda. Um, Charles Comiskey was heartbroken because of this. He, this is this one blemish on a stellar career. Uh, the, the family that owned this team they had fashioned baseball here in Chicago for 60 years. So it's, it's, a, it's a sad chapter. We think of only this one aspect of his life. Well, if I'm not mistaken, I think in 1917, C kind of 29 wins. And he, ended up, and he did sit out a couple weeks, not right at the end of the season, but I think it was like in I want to say it was in August, he sent out a couple of weeks. He did end up getting another start or two, and then did get his 30th win, but I'm just wondering, is it possible that the might have, story might have come from 17? Well, if you look in the book, it's 1917. The movie is 1919, oh, for a little more historical drama. Uh, but still, actually, the contract is not concerned that. Actually, I'm, Mr. Cannon will talk about part of Mr. Jackson's lawsuit against Comiskey was for a bonus for himself in 1917. 17, while the players were promised a $1,500 bonus if they won the American League. Question. And you mentioned that there was a possible fix in the 1918 series with the Cubs and the Red Sox. Yes. Now, the Cubs are usually capable of losing a series. <laughs> <laughs> How How would you know? you have um, this is basically, it, this is a very, very complex story with the gambling. 
This was gamblers out of Des Moines, Iowa, St. Louis, Pittsburgh, Boston, New York, and Chicago. And it was out of some St. Louis gamblers who had approached, uh, actually it was the Red Sox players, to, to lay down. And, it, and then there's, it's very complex, it's very controversial, but there's some pretty good evidence. It's actually, a lot of that's discussed in the new book um, uh, that's uh, on Rosting that came out last summer's description about the 1918 fixing. They got a hold of this guy named Barton and they planted him down the left field. <laughs> <laughs> uh, before we turn it over to Tom Cannon, I wanted to ask a few things of David. Um, the, the, the incident game eight when uh, Lefty Williams was allegedly approached before game eight instead of, you know, take care of this, you're gonna get hurt, it never happened. Well, it's, it's never been confirmed that there's a ma making up of fictional carry, character, Harry F. That, is, that person did not exist. Um, it's never been something that's actually been confirmed. He never got, uh, Lefty Williams uh, was not living at the time of uh, writing the book. It was something that could not be confirmed. So it's, it's uh, historically uh, something that the sands of time will never know for sure. Obviously, um, there was a very big first inning. Um, and the, the Reds teed up that first inning. And then the White Sox did make a pretty valid effort and did end up only losing 10 to five, come back in the eighth inning of that last game. When they cut it to four to three, was there a sense that, you know, this is, this has gone haywire, we're not going to get paid, we're not gonna get what we had agreed to do? Was there a sense that they actually tried to win it then, that they called it off? Yes, uh, this is the biggest double crossers, cheating, double crossers, cheaters, cheaters, and stuff like this. So many double crossing. And in fact, there's some big historical evidence that the Reds in game six and seven had been approached to again lay down and end up the White Sox and them back, back in the series. So a lot of interesting sidelights about that. Uh, but certainly the players realized you know, that they could get six, seven thousand dollars as part of their winning shares, that was a little more guaranteed if they could come back and win. I mean, the more you read about sleepy Bill Burns and Marge and um, Attell, who appeared to be operating on his own without Rothstein's backing, they were more like the gang that couldn't shoot straight. This was a pretty amateurish operation. But on the other hand, Rothstein was a, a really heavy duty uh, gambler and crime guy at the time, so it's entirely possible that there was some external force applied because Brodsky wound up murdered himself. That's right. I guess your next speaker will probably talk about it, but in your diagram of the fix, you said Jackson up there demanded 20000 whereas you read a book or you see the film, and he was approached. He didn't demand in the film, at least in the book, if I recall correctly. The film was inaccurate about that. Yeah. He basically, he had asked, he, he said it would take 20 and he actually, Begged off about that, um, and 